Bibles and turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I do like it when God puts it together. And uh, Miss Bonnie's song matches up with our text this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I will let you know that I went and bought myself a clock and it is on the back table behind Brother Burnett's. And uh, Miss Anita was not giving me the clues to stop. I guess she was enjoying it. Maybe I don't know. That's what I'm going to claim. And when I was a kid... I used to be so jealous. My grandma was a Methodist and uh, a dear, dear saintly lady, but she was a Methodist. So she got out of church early every Sunday. And I was Baptist and Daddy was my preacher, so he preached really long. My dad is as long-winded as can be. And I used to be so jealous. I want to be a Methodist because Grandma got out early and uh, she would always, her and Grandpa would be done eating by the time I even got there. And so I was like, I want to be a Methodist. Well, today you'll get out like a Methodist because it's 11 11. And I'm not going to keep you till 12. Uh, Lord willing, I will not keep you till 12. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, most of us are very familiar with this text, uh, dealing with the rapture of our church, rapture of Christ's church. Beginning at verse 13, we'll start reading. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Here's a verse that I like. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Lord, as we open up your word this morning and read from it, we are comforted in knowing uh, that this is not our end. Uh, To know that there's going to come a day when you're going to step into the clouds and call us to you. Lord, as we spend a few moments this morning worshiping you, we thank you for salvation, for grace and mercy, and we thank you for the hope of your second coming. Uh, To know that you didn't leave us here, that you're coming back. Lord, I pray that you would help us uh, to watch and be ready for that day. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The book of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, is where Paul had just left Philippi. So Paul is preaching in Philippi. They've imprisoned Paul. They've beaten Paul. They put him in jail. And then when they release him, he goes right back to preaching the gospel. The same thing that put him in prison, he goes right back to preaching. He leaves Philippi and he moves over to Thessalonica. Turn with me to Acts chapter 17. I want to show you what's taking place. Acts chapter 17 is where uh, Paul and Silas are arriving there. Verse 1, I'll begin reading. Now when they had passed through Aphimbalus and Apephalonia, they came to Thessalonica, where synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, to preach the gospel, went unto them three Sabbath days, reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, who I'm preaching to you, is Christ. Verse 4, And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. So Paul has just been prisoned, he's been beaten. I've never been prisoned, I've never been beaten, but this just happened to Paul, and they take him, put him in jail. When he gets released, the first thing he does is go to the next city and does the same thing. In very difficult days, we see God move in a mighty way. So you can imagine what Paul is thinking in his mind as he's just released from prison. Now he's preaching the gospel again, and a great multitude of Greeks, devout Greeks, came to know Christ. The chief women came to know Christ. It says a few of the Jews came to know Christ. So the gospel was moving forward. Verse 5, But the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. All that verse means is, they hired some thugs to come and mess up Jason. 
So they surrounded Jason's house and they began to uh, try to bring an uproar to it. They're trying to scare the gospel away, trying to scare the believers away. Verse 6, And they found them not. They drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. I pray that the world looks at our church and said, These that have turned the world upside down. These that don't go with what the world says is right, but goes with what God's Word says is right. As you continue reading through the chapter, you'll see the things that take place. Paul and Silas are going to move to the next city. As they move to the next city, a church is planted here in Thessalonica. It is a good church. Go back with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. You'll see what Paul says about their church. In verse, verse 3, he says, Remembering your work of faith without ceasing, your labor of love and patience of hope. Verse 8, it says, They became examples to others in the way to receive the word with joy. I pray that my life would be like the people at Thessalonica. That my life would be an example to other believers how to receive God's word with joy. So this is a good church that we're dealing with. When we get to chapter 4, Paul begins to deal with the walk of the believer. Our walk as a believer is important. A lot of times what we like to say is, I got saved and that was enough. And it's enough to get me to heaven because God's blood is enough. But I have a desire to walk for Him in the manner that He chooses for me to do so. Chapter 4, verse 1 through 8 is walk in holiness. God has not called us to be unclean. God has called us to be holy people. That means the things that I do, the things that I watch, the things that I say, everything about my life, God has called me to be holy people. So when I go out in the world and I see what the world is doing, I should be the opposite of them. I shouldn't be doing the same thing as them. My life should be holy. Uh, many of you that I've eaten out with before, you know I have this, this weird thing about me that I, I like to have um, my own silverware that comes in a little bag. It's so bad that Bubba bought me one time a big box of them, and I had 500 uh, utensils. And uh, you don't know who's been eating with that silverware, and so I, that's just me. I like for things to be clean. If I'm going to use it, I want it to be clean. And God has called me to be clean. I'm not going to be perfect, but He has called me to be clean. I believe the American Christian today, a lot of times, is very dirty. Amen. We take for granted and we've, we've, we've almost muted the Holy Spirit from telling us, I'm unpleased with this. I hope that you pray every day, Lord, if there's anything in my life that you're unpleased with, let me know. Reveal it to me. Help me to see it and get it right. Because I'm called to be a holy person. The second thing is verse 9 and 10, it says to walk in harmony. We're to love one another. We're to treat each other a certain way because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. The third thing is walk in honesty, verses 11 through 12. Not as hypocrites. Our world is full of hypocrites. Amen. Our government's full of hypocrites. Amen. Our church is full of hypocrites. Amen. There's a lot of believers that live a certain way on Sunday, and then on Monday you can't figure out who they are anymore. Right. It's like two different people. God is not pleased with that. We're to walk in honesty. That means the way that I act today is the same way that I should act tomorrow. And the things that are important to me today, they're important on Monday morning as well. I am to walk in honesty. The fourth part of chapter 4 is walk in hope. And that's where our text is, verses 13 through 18. I want you to look at verse 18. Uh, this is our key verse this morning. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. Part of the problem that the American Christian has today is where we find our comfort. Amen. We no longer find our comfort from God's Word. Amen. One of the worst things that has ever happened to our country is Facebook. Because what it's done is made the believer try to find comfort in some other man's words. And we go in there and look for some guy who thinks he knows everything, and the truth, he knows nothing. And he's talking for 20 to 30 minutes about things that don't even match up with God's Word. And a lot of times, believers aren't sure enough on what God's Word says, and so they listen to it. And they begin to place their comfort in other things. They place their comfort in the government. Thinking it's going to bring us relief. It's not going to bring us relief. They place their comfort in health. And although health is important, it's not going to bring us relief. Our comfort 
from what Paul said is in these verses. Too often we're letting the cares of this world weigh us down. We're letting the problems steal our hope and the circumstances take our joy. In verse 18, he says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So what are these words? It's a simple fact that Jesus Christ is coming again. There's going to come a day that there's going to be a trumpet that will sound, He'll step on the clouds, and then I'm going to lose my pool here, and I'm going to rise up to be with Him. Uh, I enjoy, if you know me, I like to be first in everything that I do. I'm very competitive. I want to be first at all times. I don't mind coming second in this race. Uh, I would love to be here when the rapture takes place. The dead in Christ will rise first. I'm going to let them go. And then I'm going to be second to go right behind them to meet them in the air. So I should comfort myself with the simple fact that Christ is coming again. I don't want to belittle the fact that our country is in a mess. It is. I don't want to belittle the fact that there's a virus that is extremely dangerous. It is. I don't want to discount anything that you're going through. But no matter what it is, the fact that Jesus Christ is coming again is bigger than whatever you're dealing with. And when my focus is on that, when my focus is centered upon that, I can have comfort in a very uncomfortable world. world. He's coming again. The second coming is mentioned 318 times in 27 chapters of the New Testament. 318 times. Could you imagine driving 27 miles down the road and seeing 318 signs? You're liable to stop at that store. Uh, when we used to go to South Carolina a lot, uh, when I was a kid, they used to have these, these signs for this store, this, this big guy with a sombrero. And I thought, the people that are paying money for this, because it seemed like every mile there was another sign. And there it was again. And there was another sign. And uh, my family never once stopped. So I guess their marketing uh, theme did not work. Could you imagine 318 signs? We're about 27 miles away from Durham. You drive to Durham and you see 318 signs telling you this. Jesus Christ is coming again. Many times a believer in this world, we forget that Christ is coming again. We're reminded of it when we read God's Word. We're reminded of it when someone preaches on it. We're reminded of it when someone sings about it. But if it's mentioned 318 times, I believe this is important enough for me to think about it every single day. In anticipation for the fact that He's coming again. So comfort one another with these words. Number 1, verses 13 through 15. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Them that are asleep, these that are passed away. He is saying in his word, we're not to sorrow as the world that has no hope. Grandma passed away this past year. Very difficult time, but I have hope that I'll see her again today. I'll see her one day. The world doesn't have that hope. When someone dies and they lay them in the ground, that's it. For them, they never think that they'll see them again. I am to live as if I have hope knowing, based on the authority of God's Word, that one day I'll see Him again. I'll ask you this question that Paul asked. Do you believe that Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and resurrected on the third day? All God's people would say yes. If we believe that, then so much more we believe that one day I'm going to see them again. Them that are asleep will rise first. The second thing, them that remain. Verse 16, For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Here's what's interesting. The beginning of the verse, for the Lord Himself. You know when Mary was told that Jesus was going to be born through her? God sent an angel. When they told Joseph that Mary was with child, but had not been with another man, He sent an angel. When they told the shepherds, they sent an angel. When Christ rose from the grave and the women went there, there were angels to tell them what it took place. When Christ ascended, there were angels to tell them what was going to happen next. But when we get to verse 16, He's not sending an angel. It says, For the Lord Himself shall have sinned. In other words, I'm important enough that He's not sending somebody else to get me. When that time comes, He Himself will step out on the cloud. He Himself will call me to Himself. And so I'm not looking for someone else. I'm not anticipating for my government to get me out of this. I'm not anticipating for my finances to get me out of this. One day, the Lord Himself shall descend. The trumpet's going to sound. 
and I'll be called to meet him in the air. The third thing is the meeting in the clouds. Look at verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I'm looking forward to the day because the first thing I see there is that we're going to meet together with them. Who is the them? That's my grandma that's passed away. That's my grandpa that's passed away. That's the loved ones that we've lost this past year. We're going to meet them there. They're there. Remember, they rose first. So I'm going to meet them in the air. I'm looking forward to the reunion. I don't know what it's going to be like. I can't even begin to explain what it's going to feel like. But I know I'm going to be there. And I'm going to see them once again. But then more importantly than them is the Lord. At the end of the verse, it says to meet the Lord in the air. I'll finally be face to face with the one that died for me. And then he says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That word ever means I'm not going to be separated from him anymore. I'm not going to go through COVID-19 anymore. I'm not going to have to vote for another president anymore because I've got my Savior. Amen. When I get to that point, I'm with Him forever. So Paul says, comfort yourself with these words. One day, one day, all this not going to matter to me anymore. All this is going to lose its pull, just like the song was saying, and I'll be meeting with Him in the air. All my troubles, all my trials will be gone. I'll be with Him forever. So if we understand this, that Christ is coming again, we understand that one day He's coming to take me home. There's three truths that I want us to look at this morning, and then we'll be finished. Number one, during these days there are still sinners to be saved. There are sinners to be saved. He's still in the saving business. When our world has gotten to the place that it's gotten, that means that he's still a great God. It's different now. The other day I was at a store and I went to hand a lady a track and she said, we're not allowed to take those. Now that's the first time that's ever happened to me. Our world is changing, but our gospel is not. Our world is changing and believers should not be changing. Paul was beaten in prison and continued to give the gospel out. So if someone says to me, I'm not able to take that, that's nowhere near what Paul went through. I'm to continue to give the gospel out. He's still in the saving business. I'm thankful for the day when I was seven years old in a Sunday school classroom. When the Sunday school teacher asked, is there anyone here that doesn't know they go to heaven when they die? And I raised my hand and said, ma'am, I have no idea. She explained to me that Jesus Christ died for my sins. She explained to me that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That I needed to be saved. I'm praying that the young people next door to us are hearing that this morning. I'm praying their hearts are understanding what's taking place. Uh, this week, uh, Emma and Crystal were telling me, Crystal was asking Emma questions about things she learned in school, and, and she understands that God created the world. She understands that Jesus came and died for her. She understands that Jesus rose again on the third day. and she's, she's quizzing her all these questions. And so she knows all the facts. And I'm ready for it to all to come together when she understands, He died for me, I can be saved. That's what took place when I was seven years old. And Christ is still saving people. Amen. I'm going to heaven not because I grew up in church. I've been in church my entire life. I've been in church uh, since the day I was born. When I was born, Daddy was leading the choir. And then before I knew it, he was preaching at the church. And so I've just been here the whole time. My whole life has been wrapped around the church. Even when I didn't want to go, I was there. When I wanted to go, I was there. Sometimes I was asleep and I was there. I was always at the church, but that doesn't get me to heaven. When that trumpet sounds, that won't matter at all. What matters is the decision I made when I was seven years old to ask Jesus Christ to save my soul. So here's a question that I ask you this morning. If I could tell you that tomorrow at 9 a.m. Jesus Christ was going to come back, who would you go tell tonight? Who in your family? Who do you work with? Who that you're friends with? That you know if that took place, they're going to be left behind. What would you do differently? What urgency would you have? How would you change your words? Would your boldness increase knowing that in just a few hours we're out of here? But they're not. Because see, if they're not saved, 
That's the end for them. They're going to live through uh, the seven years that are going to be much worse than anything that we've ever experienced. I won't see any of that, but they will. Christ is still in the saving business. And during these days, they're sinners to be saved. As a believer, part of my responsibility to watch and wait is to tell others what's coming. To tell others what's going to take place so that they're not left behind. Number two, there are saints to be perfected. So if there's sinners to be saved, there's saints to be perfected. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. This is a scripture where a lot of times we read and a lot of the men, they puff their chest up because we're about to tell the women to submit to their husbands. But we're not going to deal with that this morning. I'm not going to get involved with that. I'll leave that with Pastor. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So here he says that to sanctify his church, that word sanctify means to separate from profane things and dedicate to God. In other words, to take that which is in with me that God is unpleased with and separate it. So as I'm waiting for the day that he returns... He is looking to sanctify me. What are those things, those profane things I need to be separated from? Then he says to cleanse. This is to remove the dirt and the stains. So I've gotten rid of all the things that God's unpleased with, and now I need to be clean from the things that God's unpleased with. He is to sanctify and to clean. And how does he do this with the Word? Uh, One thing that's interesting, Jewish tradition, when a couple was going to get married, One of the things they did was they both got baptized. Uh, Not the same type of baptism that we're used to, but they had a baptism type service. So both the groom and the bride would be baptized. That's why I believe in this verse, the way he said it. The washing of the water by the word. Remember, Christ was baptized. I'm his bride. I've been washed by the word, getting ready for the wedding day where we'll meet in the air. So that... The reason that he might present it to himself and he gives us a list. The first thing is a glorious church. The word glorious means held in great esteem. If there's anyone that deserves a glorious bride, it's my Savior. I remind you, he left heaven to come here to die for me and you. I remind you that they beat him, they spat upon him, they put a crown of thorns on his head, they crucified him. Every possible pain you can imagine, they did to him. And he did it for me and you. So if anyone deserves a sanctified, cleansed, glorious bride, it's my Savior. He says they're not having spot. This means a moral blemish. A wrinkle. This means an unwanted fold uh, in the wedding garments. We should be holy and without blemish. Prepare for the day that he's going to come back. June 27, 2009 is the date that me and Crystal got married. It's important that I remember that date uh, to stay out of trouble. That was a wonderful day in my life. When I stood there in the church up at the sanctuary and they opened the door and I saw there and the, uh, the wedding dress that she's wore one time and spent a lot of money for that is in my closet for some strange reason. Uh, that, that one item and she was fully decked out. I mean, she had even a, the tiara in her hair. She had the veil over her. She was, she was beautiful. She looked amazing. She was prepared for her wedding day. It's interesting when it comes time for a wedding day, there's, I put down the preparation for the day. Most people go on a weight loss plan before they, they get married. That's what most people do. 
You know, I've got to fit into that dress. I've heard that a thousand times from people. I've got to fit into that dress. And so they exercise and they work out and then they get married and all of it goes away. And uh, the preparation for that day. We get everything we can to get ready for that day. There's this build up to it. There's this excitement about it. And we're doing everything we can to get ready for that one moment. Our wedding ceremony lasted, I think, like 20 minutes. It was as short as I could make it uh, within the reasons of my wife being okay with it. It was as short as it could be. But there was, there was four years of preparation of me begging her to say yes to marrying me to get to that date. There was all this preparation for that moment. There was the anticipation for the day. Many times when you're doing a wedding day, there's a big business style of these countdown calendars. And you put these calendars up and you count down day after day after day. And it about make you lose your mind. We had one of, my wife had one of those. And uh, it was counting down every single day. How close are we? I used to get texts every morning. This is how many days we're away. Thank you for telling me once again. I appreciate it. You know, the anticipation of it. There's an excitement to it. Why? Because I'm about to be married. And then the adornment of that day. The way that we prepare ourselves. I wore a tux. It's the only time in my life I've wore a tux that I remember. I didn't want to wear a tux. She made me wear a tux. I wore one. We got, and it's not comfortable. I wore shoes that were miserable. I wore clothes that were miserable. Why? To look a certain way on that day. One of these days, Christ is coming back for me. There should be a preparation for that day. I should be preparing for that day. Not preparing for the future here, but preparing for the future there. I am convicted to tell you I spend more time preparing my retirement than I do the second coming of Christ. And that's wrong. I spend more time preparing my vacations than I do preparing for Jesus coming again. There should be a preparation for that day. There should be an anticipation for that day. Every day I should leave my house and look up and say, it's the day to the day. I sure hope it is. Every day at work, when I take my lunch break and I walk outside, I should look and say, Lord, is it today? Anticipating, waiting for it, instead of forgetting about it. Instead of going on about my life, as he said in verse 13, as those with no hope. There should be an adornment for that day. I should be dressed in a certain way, ready to meet my Savior. The Jewish tradition, I wanted to share with you, Something that I researched and found out. The Jewish tradition is uh, when, let's say that I was going to marry Crystal, and this was old Orthodox Jews, my dad would have arranged that. And so I would have been glad if he would have picked Crystal, I suppose. And then he would have sent me to her house. I would have went to Brother Don and Sister Bonnie's house, and I would have laid down a price, some type of sacrifice. After I laid down the sacrifice, they accepted it. I would then go back to my father's house. Me and my father would begin to build what would be mine and Crystal's house. This process would typically take about a year. During this time, we were considered a spouse but not considered married. There would be no marital relations. There would be no living together. I really wouldn't even see her. But she would know that one day when I was done and the Father said the house is ready, I was going back to get her. Jesus Christ left the Father's house. He came here on Calvary. He placed a sacrifice to purchase me and you. Then He went back to the Father's house to begin to prepare the place for me and for you. And He's been building that house. And he's building it. And one day, the father's going to say, it's time. The house is ready. And at that moment, he's going to step out on the clouds. And just like in Jewish tradition, as the bride, I'm going to hear the trumpet. And I'm going to be with him forevermore. So because of this, the way the bride lived her life was amazing. She knew that it was somewhere around a year. But actually didn't know the actual day. So they say that every single day she would get up and she would get ready as if this is the day. Today's the day. Because she had no idea. She didn't want her husband to show up and her be wearing sweatpants and a sweatshirt and her hair all in those roller things. 
She got up every day and put her makeup on. She put the best dress she had on. And she stood at the window watching. Said, is he here? There was no other men that walked by that she got distracted with. She went no other place. She had no other goal in life but just to watch for the day that he would come. She would keep the oil in their lamps just in case he came at night. That's where the parable of the ten virgins come from. The oil in her lamp, in case the groom came at night, she wanted to be ready no matter how light or how dark it was. She wanted to be ready for that day. Anticipation for his coming. There's this story told of this little girl who asked her mommy, and she said, Mommy, do you believe that Jesus is going to come back one day? She said, yes, I do believe it. She said, and when she comes back, we won't know it until right then. She goes, yep. And then she said, Mommy, can he come back today or tomorrow? And the mommy said, yes, sweetie, she can come back. He can come back at any moment. He can come back in the next second. And the little girl looked at her mommy and said, will you comb my hair? Will you brush my hair? Will you put my dress on for me? Just in case he comes today, I want to be ready. The anticipation that he's coming back. Thinking about it. Living about it. Comfort yourself with these words. He's coming again. Then the third thing then will be done. There's a place being prepared. So we've seen there's sinners to be saved. Saints to be perfected. And then there's a place that's being prepared for me and for you. I'm going to have a mansion there. Amen. Most of you know that me and Crystal are looking for a house at this point And we're... We're searching all over the place. And uh, I'm, I would be fine just going straight to this mansion. The, um, she wants to have a mansion here, and, and my budget says no. And so, you know, well, tell her one day in glory you'll have your mansion. And uh, Jesus paid for it for you. I'm looking forward to that day. There's a place being prepared for me. But I'll tell you the truth, as much as I would like to have a mansion, I, that's not my concern. One of these days, I'm going to be face to face with them. I'm not going to care where I live. I'm not going to care about the mansion. I'm not going to care if it's a tent. I'm going to be with my Savior. He tells us about that place. I can't explain it much, but they say, Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. Uh, in Romans, Paul said, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. It's a place where there's no more pain. There's no more tears. Amen. No more surgery. No more sorrow. No more sin. No more Satan. There's no more government. Hallelujah. Amen. There's no more COVID-19. There's no more vaccines. There's no separation. There's no death. All these things in life that we just are miserable to us, they're gone. He's preparing a place for me and a place for you where all these things are gone, but then also it's a place of perfection. I'm complete. I now have a glorious body. I'm with my Savior forevermore. He's preparing me and you a place. I'm looking forward to the place. I'm interested to know who my neighbor's going to be. See my grandparents again. There's many people that have passed away this past year. I'm looking forward to seeing them there as well. The place that is being prepared for me and for you. Comfort yourself with these words. Jesus is coming again. We are comforted knowing that there are sinners to be saved, saints to be perfected, and a place is being prepared. And Jesus is coming again. Uh, as Sister Bonnie comes to the piano, I want you to think about this one question. If tomorrow is the day, what do we do differently? If tomorrow is the day, what do we say to our loved ones that are lost? Do we stop caring what they think about our boldness about the gospel? There's a song we used to sing at school. Uh, Some golden daybreak, Jesus will come. Some golden daybreak, battles all won. He'll shout the victory, break through the blue. Some golden daybreak for me and for you. When I was a kid, my, my dad and his sisters used to sing this song. There's a longing in my heart for His appearing. I'll gladly leave behind these trials here below. For this journey has been hard and I'm so weary. But Lord, I feel I'm so much closer to going home just any day now. 
Our Lord is coming. He'll be returning for you and for me. I've been watching and I've been waiting just any day now. His face I'll see. Then I was reminded of the song that the choir sings often. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon His face. The one who saved me by His grace when He takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. There will be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face. He's the one who saved me. He's the one that died for me. There's coming a day that I can be comforted with on these words. Jesus is coming again. I ask you this question. Are you ready? There's two types of people here this morning. Those that are going with me when He calls us and those that are left behind. If you're one of those that will be left behind, today is the day you can say, Lord, I understand that I'm a sinner. I understand that if I died today or if you came back today, I would be left behind. But Lord, I ask you to forgive me of my sins and save my soul and then you can go with me When he calls us back, the second type of person is the person that's going with us. But we have to understand as believers, there's still sinners to be saved. There's still saints to be perfected. I don't want to be ashamed in the day that he comes. I want to be watching and waiting. So she begins to play. I ask that you would stand to your feet. If you.